we have to create the right vibe, you know, the energy and everybody at the organization has to feel so privileged to be here. It's, it's no other way. Thanks for listening to the Purely Arsenal podcast. Please follow us on Twitter at Purely Arsenal FP for all the latest Arsenal podcasts. Welcome to another edition of a Purely Arsenal sit down podcast. We're back to review a battering of Brighton at the Amex. Kai Hard, I'm going to call this podcast, I think, as John sent me a little meme and I thought, yeah, that works quite well. Uh, Live Free or Kai Hard, I don't know. So many with Kai Havertz. He was the man of the match. There could have been a couple of others, but I think he, pick, he he's the one to pick from it. And Neil, we're here to review it. Big game, big performance, big win, maybe our best win away from home so far in the league this season in terms of all round performances. It's up there for sure. But we're going to discuss it. Neil Shaw, how you doing, Neil? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Five five away clean sheets on the trot. Can't ask for better than that, can we? So, yeah, uh, buzzing. Yeah, buzzing. incredible that we've had five away clean sheets on the trot. And just selecting those five is more than anyone else has had in the league, <laughs> including Liverpool and That's City. That's a good point. Yeah, mm. it's more than they've had in the league. I think the, the next team is Liverpool and City with four. Oh. Um, and uh, I don't know how many clean sheets we've had away from home, but it's a lot more than five. Um, mm. And we've had uh, David Arias had 13 clean sheets, is it? In wow. something like 25, 20, 25, 26 oh, yeah. games because yeah. he missed the first four. Um, so he's he's well um, on the route to the Golden Glove, isn't it? Really, is the Golden Glove based on based on clean sheets or goals conceded? It's goals conceded. I don't even know. Uh, we'll have to I'm look not that sure, up. You know. But he, well, either either way, we're top of both of those currently. Yeah, we're first. Um, yeah, we're first in both of those. Our goal difference is looking pretty healthy, and so is our points so at the moment because we're top um, currently. Obviously, Liverpool to play tomorrow, which will. We'll maybe touch on a little bit, but Neil, going into this one, I was nervous. I was nervous. Brighton are the fifth um, best expected goals team in the league still after a pretty topsy-turvy season for them being in Europe. Yeah. They've had a drop-off in the league, a little bit like Newcastle had, though a different team, a team that really tries to play progressive football. I was worried. Uh, we, we hadn't had much turnover, much rest. We did rotate a lot in midweek when we beat Luton, so that was healthy. We made four changes for this game. Um, Neil, I, I wanna, I'm going to come back to the lineup stuff because I know we don't, you don't love the lineup questions, but I want to talk about how we started the game. I felt in the first 20 minutes, tell me if you think different, but I felt in the first 20 minutes, um, whilst we, we created a lot, well, you know, Saka had a missed chance just past the post. Jesus had a lovely chance on the edge of the area. But at the same time, I also felt they were um, breaking from our press really comfortably and almost bypassing our midfield, not creating a ton, but getting to the point of creative territory. And I just felt it was a little bit chaotic. Um, and we're not used to seeing that with Arsenal. How did you feel in those early stages? Because I think I text something to the group, something like we're a bit all over the place here. And other people watching it may not have felt that. But did you feel the same thing? Or were you like calm and confident and collected? How did you feel? Yeah, I I think I, I I was kind of like that, but I was I was calm. Um, look, Brighton are a tricky side. They are fast, and I wasn't expecting anything different, to be honest. And I thought they're actually you're right. They were breaking away pretty efficiently. I thought they had a number on us. I thought, okay, this is this is interesting. But actually, Jack, while they were whilst they were doing that, I still believe that we were quite defensively organised. Um, they, we, we always kept our shape and we just kept getting bodies in the way and they just couldn't, although they were getting past us in the meeting, they even at times have, may have had defenders you know, behind us and all the rest of it. I just felt that we were so well organised. It just wasn't amounting to anything. And I think, I think where I would have been worried, Jack, is if it was just all one-way traffic, I them doing that all the time, um, like we've been doing to teams, to be honest, recently. Uh, and trying to find the break, maybe. maybe then I think I better have been a bit concerned. But we were creating as well, and I felt um, there was there was one player that I I I, I, I want to mention, and it's not Kai Havertz, it's actually Jorginho. There was a couple of those uh, breakaways where we had chances. I think it was um, the second one where he put wide. He started. He threaded that ball through initially. It was a great pass. And then the other was that Jorginho or was that was that Ben Jorginho White? To it was Jorginho oh, to White. To White. Sorry. It, Sorry, it was a really good. And then White 
White Feli to Saka, and then right. I think he um he he put it wide, which was unlike him because that you know nine times out of ten he puts that in the net. Yeah. Uh, so that was one of our chances. Then the other one where Jesus completely mistimed the header. He was actually asking it, asking for the ball from Kai Havertz. The guy that passed it to Havertz was Jorginho again. It was great, great a through ball. And the Kai Havertz actually he controlled it really well in the box because he had players players around him and that's when I started noticing that you know what Kai Havertz is going to be great well, he's playing really well and I, I think I put it quite early that so far has been man of the match for me um, and Kai Havertz again just to, sorry just to go from him from Jorginho he was defending as well so, so was Jorginho when I was going back to that defensive shape I was talking about Jorginho and Havertz were defending as well really well and I love that that our forwards because Martin only tends to do it even Jesus gets stuck in the other I think was it which game was it that we talked about where he was helping out um, Kiwi? Or it, was, it was a game before Luton, wasn't it? I think it was. Where, yeah, against Man City, wasn't it? Yeah, of course yeah. it was. Yeah. Um, and um, it, that's what I like about our forwards. They're doing quite a lot uh, in terms of, well, they have to be because we've got the most score, best record for goals scored as well as uh, you know, least goals to see. Correct, it. Neil. But they but but they but they're doing they're, they're doing the work defensively, and they're also defending not when not just going back to our goal mouth. They're also defending up from the top. Uh, it's just such a well balanced, well drilled team at the moment, where everyone seems to know their roles and everyone is excelling at their roles. So I wasn't worried, Jack. Although as I said, you were right. They they they've got some good players, you know, Brighton. They're a, they're a good team. It's just that they can't. They just can't complete their moves. They, you know, there was a time in, in a few years ago where we were brilliant. We were so good to watch. We were easy to, on the eye, even after we'd lost all those players. But Wenger still had a team that could play good football. But we just couldn't seem to be lethal at the end, the finish. We just couldn't finish yeah. off well. It's, I, I kind of saw that in Brighton a little bit yesterday. That they were doing everything right, but their final third. But that also that also is credit to us mm. and our defensive balance. So. No, I wasn't that worried. But yeah, we had some great chances early on. But I, you could just see it's going to come. We were just so good at what we were doing. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. We're, t- we're, a, we're a different animal now, do, uh, Jack, for sure. I think that's what's impressive because I'll be honest, I felt Gabriel's touch early on in the first 20 was a little bit off. I felt Rice um, got turned from, from Balaba a couple of times and I was like, oh, he looks a little bit not leggy, but just almost like, you know, the midweek rest as he needs to pick it up again. He's so used to continually playing, right? Sometimes those players that play constantly, you you worry about pulling them out as well. You know, the, the Havertz, the Rices, the Odegaards, because of rhythm. It's rhythm. Like Xhaka just had rhythm, you know? And I, I, you hear that a lot from managers that sometimes you, you don't want to pull them out because they're in such good rhythm. They're used to it. They don't feel the pain. They keep fighting through and I, I just, but what I really love about Mikel Teter is I think he sees what's on offer and he adapts to it in game, right? So I felt, I felt we weren't really getting anywhere with our press. Like we were trying, we, we were trying to press them. And if you remember the first game at home, Neil, we pressed them so well in that game. Like the, we were like, wow, they 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 just continually played out the back and we're continually catching them. And we beat them only two 0 but it was a dominant performance. Kai Havertz scored again. And um, but at the time, we were thinking it was one of our best performances as well. And But in this one, I just felt that for, after that first 20 minutes, it's just everything settled right down. I felt we eased a little bit off our press. We were like, well, okay, just ease a little bit off. We're not going to go as gung-ho on the press a little bit and, and, and commit as many bodies forward. And suddenly they couldn't bypass us anymore. And Rice looked a bit more comfortable and Jorginho was on the ball more and... It just looked like everything has settled. But you're right, even within that 20 minutes, we had by far the best chances. The Saka one wide, like you said. The, I think it was Jesus from the edge of the area. It was a fantastic save when you saw it from, from the back view. Um, you mentioned that the header one, which Jesus should have done better with that header, to be fair. Um, I, I completely forgot about that one until you mentioned it. But but now you're And the Gabriel of the first minute from the Odegaard. Oh, that was my gosh. Great. It reminded me of the, of the Liverpool away game, that header. But it obviously he scored from that header. Yeah. Same thing, free kick. Oh, what, a, uh, what a ball up. from Odegaard. Yeah, though. lovely little floater. He did the same thing on to Gabriel for, for the Liverpool game. And I, I thought he was offside because I was like, what well, well, how's he so free? But yeah. he but he wasn't. And it was um that was a bit that was a big miss to be fair. He had a couple of those Gabriel in this game we could have done a little bit better from. But but everyone settled after that. Um and, and, and we really started to play some some good stuff, you know. Um and just before we get to the, the first goal and a penalty incident we've seen against City 
Jesus, Jesus didn't play at all midweek. He didn't even come on in midweek, which I felt was quite telling with how we're managing him physically. Um, it'll be very interesting to see how much he plays this midweek because obviously it's a bigger game against Bayern in the Champions League. But what do you think, Neil, of, of Jesus being sort of deployed out left? On the one hand, it makes perfect sense because... Kai Havertz is clearly now, and I think Arteta's quotes, which I'll pull up in a second, were really, um, really quite, not damning, but quite, quite insightful of where he thinks Kai Havertz's future lies. And this was the first time he really reacted to saying something. It said something along the lines of sometimes players kind of tell you where they're, they're going to play by the way they're, they're moving and, and where they're picking up the ball and stuff like that. But I think it's this game, but along since January, we've kind of proven that Kai Havertz is is, is our, our best number nine option. But also we've mentioned even before that, that Gabriel Jesus could be a wing option for us. And I just wonder what your thoughts are of him at the, on the left wing. We've seen it against City where we had very little of the ball. We've seen it against Brighton where we had far more of the ball. In both games, I'd say he was heavily involved in a lot of our attacking play, though quite wasteful. Um, I just wondered what your thoughts are because the left wing is not somewhere where we're struggling to find players, but it does seem like Mikel Tetter is, is, is using him there. And I don't necessarily think it's a, it's a short term, a couple of game thing. I think we might see a little more of it possibly. I don't know. What are your thoughts on it with Gabriel Jesus? Because he's definitely valuable to the team. He's so much for it. So on the ball, so, um, so, so involved. But at the same time, you do feel sometimes feel he's, he takes too many touches, he's a little bit wasteful. Uh, you know, he, he, the same Gabriel Jesus stuff that sometimes frustrates you at the nine, you know? I think that's my main concern, that he's not um, putting in or converting as many chances as he, sh as he should. I mean, look, he had, he had two in the first 20 minutes yesterday. All right, I mean, the save was in his fault. He did, that was everything. He, he, he could have done anything better than more than that. The goalkeeper just made a tremendous save. It's yeah. one of those... He couldn't have done anything more. But um, to be honest, I'm not really giving it much thought. The only thing that has bothered me about it, it's not so much how it might be affecting him either positively or negatively. It's more that he's keeping Trossard and Martin Martinelli out, which is bothering me. It's not about him because I think he's quite capable of playing on both sides. He's played on the right. Remember once where, he, I mean, you, you're the one that mentioned it, Jack. Remember we played Jesus there in front, instead of Saka because remember you've always had this issue about we need someone to you know, cover Saka and we need yep. someone to maybe, maybe not so much give him competition, it's, well, it doesn't need it, is it really, but just to cover him if nothing else. And then I think we saw Jesus play there a couple of times and he was all right. He was quite effective there. Um, and you were even thinking, well, there's your answer. It, we, maybe we don't need to buy externally and we've got it. We've got that player in Jesus because you're right, we've got an abundance on the left anyway. You've got, um, you've got players who play behind them that uh, can work well with them as well. Um, you know, Kibios, Sean, recently we've got Tommy Asu, Zinni's the, I mean, Zinni even, when things are going well, I've always said he's all right as a player. It's when we've got to really be tough, tough at the back where I worry about Zinni because I still have question marks about his defending. Oh, that's a good point. You said if I was concerned yesterday, he was the one that was just making me a bit nervous at the back because obviously with Bright Brighton made threading those um, attacking moves together he was worrying me. So just that's just a quick, quick point away. As, and sorry, I digress there. But Jesus, no. I mean, look, I think we've all said it from the start that he's not a prolific goal scorer. He's not going to get your 15, 20 goals a season, but he offers so much. A bit like how I saw Kai Havertz um, when he started getting, his, getting comfortable in, in his position. I thought he may not be scoring loads of goals, but he's such a menace and he's so useful to have there because he's he's really distracting the defenders and that's giving the opportunity for the others to, to have time and room to do their thing, i.e. the Sackers, the Martinelli's, Trossards or even Jesus. But Kai's actually now starting to put the ball in the net. I mean, he scored, how many goals has he scored now? Is it nine? He's got 13 goal involvements in the league, nine goals, right. four assists in there you go. games. But right. a large proportion of those games were from midfield, you know. Right. Well, okay. So he's, he's, he's a bit like that, but I, th I think the only thing that I would want now, I, I've never, it never bothered me before, but I want Jesus just to put maybe a couple more in the net 
But it's not him that I'm worried about on the left. I don't want Martinelli to come in and play on the right. That is bothering me. Even even as he's coming on the substitute, I think Martinelli is far more effective on the left or even centre. But Kai Havertz at the moment is Kai Havertz is the new um, Saka stroke Rice. Doesn't seem to um, don't tempt don't um, don't tempt fate, Neil. Don't jinx it. But he looks fit, doesn't he? He looks like a a really strong player. We were saying saying it on the podcast after Man City, yeah. I think, that we were thinking, oh, is Saka going to feature? And obviously he was actually dropped for Luton, but he knew that it wasn't going to be a long-term out, is it? Because he said it himself. He was in, in the interview yesterday on, on, from Sky. He said, if my legs are working, I'm playing, no matter what. Uh, it's just made of, he's just ridiculously strong, Saka. And, but you can see that kind of that attribute in Rice, Rice is going to be a player that's going to probably play a lot more than he's going to miss for injury. Kai Havertz looks fit and strong and able. So, you know, um, he's going to feature and he's going to be in the middle. So I, I don't see how Martinelli should be stuck on the left, uh, sorry, on the right, where he's yeah. far more effective on the left. So that's my concern mainly with it, Jack. I hope I hope that's temporary. I I, I mm. see no value to doing that um, for meaningful moments. I, I I don't really. We did it against City late on, and that worried me a little bit because I I don't recall, and he's played him there a few times. Ever being very impressed with Martinelli on the right wing, he, he seems like away from the group almost. He doesn't get involved as much. It just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And and. If you're going to use Jesus on the wings, like you said, just just play him out on the on the right. I understand if Saka's playing, so this starting lineup, I get it. But you know, and and obviously, I think Jesus was one of the one of the earlier substitutions. So okay, that you know, then who do we have to come out on the right? Because he's not going to use Nelson in games like this. We know that already. So, I, like, like I said, hopefully that's temporary. Hopefully that's temporary, and we start to see Jesus pop because I think Jesus will be as active, as involved as creative from both wings. He's just that type of player. Like when you watch him on the left wing, does he does he look much different to you than when he is at the nine? He doesn't really. He's all involved. He goes for every ball. He drops deep. He he, he helps defensively, but he did all those things from the nine. The difference with Kai Havertz is I don't think he drops anywhere near as much deep as Jesus, but also he, when he does do it, he has the ability to do both. He can go beyond the last defender and he can drop deep. And you're right about his fitness. I mean, how many attacking players do we have that rarely get substituted in 90 minutes? Now, suddenly you've got Kai Havertz, who's basically our number nine. And if we are subbing him, we're subbing him in the last five, you know, and that's, that's a, that's a, that's, you know, that's a real sort of, impression that he makes on his on his fitness you know he, he, i mean he's he's he can really continue to go even if he's looking tired he's constantly going for balls and causing problems and yeah like you said even early on he's creating the jesus header that from the throw in he's pushing dunk out the way and almost scoring do you remember that moment he's just a nightmare he's just a nightmare for it and i do i'm really reluctant to talk about like what this means for the future because i think that has to be a conversation that happens at the end of the season but it really could change what a lot of fans think it means for the future, right? Everyone's talking about the number nine, the number nine, the number nine. Because Arteta might not be thinking that. He might be thinking, hold on a minute. Let me just see what we have here. Because if we have something that maybe I initially didn't think, and I think it's fair to argue that Mikel Arteta didn't initially believe um, Kai Havertz was a number nine because he barely played there for the first six months of the season. So I know he played in the Community Shield, but until the FA Cup game against Liverpool, he did not do that. So I think it's, and he was pretty honest about it in the post game. You know, he's kind of like he's changed his thought process basically on where Kai Havertz's future may lie. But you know, let's get to the the, the first big moment. Although know, I think at the point of the goal happening, I don't know what minute it was, you know, thirty fifth, forty fifth minute. But I think we were all quite frustrated in the sense of we should have taken our chances here. We've had three or four big chances. We've not taken them. We've been a little bit wasteful in front of goal. We've taken the extra touch. There was a point at the end of the first half, I think it was actually after the penalty, where we were just we were just in their box for like five or six minutes. And it just it just felt like we couldn't get it out of our feet to take the shot on. And I remember being very, very frustrated. But the penalty nil, um, I have Lee Dixon on my phone. I absolutely despise him as a commentator. I have to say, I loved him as a right back, but there's a reason Laura replaced you, and I hope he replaced you as a commentator, to be honest. And um, he, he just he just tries to be too impartial. You know, far too, and the better we're getting, the more impartial he's trying to be. And 
he went on about this penalty for 15 to 20 minutes. And I, and I do not understand it, Neil. To me, it was a stonewall penalty. Where's your thought process on it being a penalty or not and what people were saying about the about Lamptey making contact with the ball? It's a joke, I'm sorry to say. I mean, look, it, it, people might watch or listen to this bond thing. Yeah, they just biased me. So I'm still fans. And it was an Arsenal fan that uh, said to me, well, you know, I was looking at it from both views, if that same incident had happened against you, how would you feel? And I said, I would have felt it was a penalty. It's simple as that. He got more of Jesus than he did of the ball. And even if he did touch the ball, which I think, all right, he might have had the, the slightest of touches. Jesus, if he hadn't been tripped, would have still been on it. That's the thing. And it stopped him. It, it almost like, irrespective of him making a feather touch of the ball, it stopped Jesus from creating a goal-scoring opportunity in the box and correct me if I'm wrong Jack that means penalty does it not it, I, I saw it and I thought I'm kind of I'm trying to understand why people are going on and on about this afterwards now you mentioned Lee Dixon I've got Alan Smith here who's exactly the same he's going well I can understand why VAR are looking at it and he goes it's going to be a really tricky one for VAR I'm like how can it be a tricky alright VAR when it comes to us make it tricky because they just want to make it tricky for us so I thought in that respect he's right but not for the reason he was saying. He was literally saying, well, I'm not so sure. You know, I can understand why it won't be given. And right, what are you on about? It's a stonewall penalty. And what what frustrated me afterwards was the that idiot on Sky. I think uh, I asked you guys whose name, what, whose name it was. Dave Jones, yeah. Yeah. And he's like constantly on about it at halftime. Right, you've dealt with it at halftime. Now, why don't you talk about how good we were? Because... There's not many teams that can go to Brighton and do what we did to them. But yet, all he seemed to focus on again, all right, you, 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 you're you going to bring up the, the, the penalty again at full time because you're going to speak about all the goals and all the incidents as a summary, like we're doing very much in this podcast. But you've already spoken about the co- made potential controversy about it at half time. Why bring it up again at full time? Then just talk about the fact how good penalty, you know, Saka converted it. Why are you bringing up the controversy about it? And I thought, there's such a narrative with the, these channels against us. You know, if it had been anyone else, they'd be going, oh, what an amazing... Dip-. If you had been Man City or Liverpool, you, you don't go to Brighton away and do that to them the way we did. We absolutely steamrolled them in the end. I know you were saying there was a few concerns at the beginning and stuff, but Jack, that was another great performance against a very difficult and tricky side. But no, no, no. Let's talk about how that might not have been given and was it a stonewall penalty? And da, da, da. And it's like, I'm so glad, you know, we've got Theo as a pundit now. Because he's brilliant. He, he, it's, it's just like, yeah, all right, whatever, you know. But let's talk about how Saka actually, and he, Saka then came in to be interviewed and Theo's asking him the right questions because how do you prepare? You know, you're doing so well. It's like five now in the, on the trot that he's converted quite, you know, comprehensively. He was more focused on that rather than the flipping controversy of the whole thing. I don't understand what people's agenda is, Jack. It's getting on my nerves. Yeah, it's, it's a strange one. Like you said, he, Jesus does really well to get into the box before contact is made. I think he was very clever there. And, and that is his that is a big thing that you notice he does. He tries to get into the box as quickly as possible when he gets the ball and then and then tries to take on the player. And it, the biggest thing I say is is look at the reaction of the defender that made the tackle as well. He doesn't, he puts his head down, he walks away, he doesn't even moan. He knows he's taken the player out entirely. It doesn't matter if your top of your foot skimmed the ball, Lee. And they kept going on about, it. well, there's contact there. And I was like, yeah, even in your day, Lee, that's a foul. Even in your day, he's dove in, in the box, he's, he's touched the ball, he's skimmed the ball with the top of his foot and he's wiped out both feet of the player. It's a foul all day long, anywhere on the pitch. Um, it's just... I, I, I didn't understand it. Even in the second half, at the start of it, he's banging on about it. I'm like, yeah. Lee, mate, you, you, you're literally digging yourself a bigger and bigger. Like, just just stop talking. You're just looking stupider and stupider. Very strange. Very, very strange. I found it very odd for them to, to question it. Now you get all these comparisons from Liverpool fans to their one against Man City, which wasn't even similar because McAllister didn't even have the ball under control for starters. Um, you know, there, there was there was no, it was just a 50-50 coming together with a little bit of a high foot, sure, but it was, I wasn't a pen to me, that one. This one, he's gone past the player. He's been swiped out. 
it's about as clear as you can possibly get. I mean, it really is, and I don't really understand it. But he steps up to Saka. I heard his comments after the game about how he prepares for the penalty, and I like that because I've, even this season I've seen him take one or two, and I thought, well, he got a little lucky there with the penalty that it went in. You know, he's, he's not necessarily here as cleanly, but this one, he struck beautifully right into the side net, and it was really, really good. It was a little bit like the one against... Um, Auto in the, in the you know he took his time and he bomb stepped up and I think he put it against the same side against Porto and you just felt then oh brilliant, and now because the way we are Neil I mean, the XG conceded for us um, this season is just incredible I mean the, the, the it comes out with a data point doesn't it for XG conceded and um, in 2024 and ours is uh, 4.98. And the next team closest to us is Man City on 12.28. I mean, it's quite incredible, you know, and then it's Liverpool on 13.56. I mean, we are, we've conceded four goals in 2024 in the league. One of them was an own goal against Liverpool. So all our own doing, they had one shot on target in that game, by the way. And, um, um, you know, and, and the others, I can't think, one was away at Forest. There was a little bit lucky as well, but... We've been absolutely tremendous defensively. And that's what, when you go up 1-0, even me, the the, the internal warrior, um, I, you know, I feel a little bit, oh, I'm a lot more relaxed. I'm like, okay, they have to do something special here to score, um, you know. And what I liked about it, Neil, what 1-0 was, I think there's been an argument with Mikel Arteta, maybe a little bit last season, certainly the season before, that 1-0 sometimes he kind of plays 2-0 football. I think we we had this conversation last year that where he'd sit off too much and invite pressure at 1-0. And what I was really impressed about in the second half specifically was it felt to me like we really were desperate to get the second goal. We really took the onus on that we need, hey, we need to. We've got plenty of time left in the game here. We need to get that second goal. And then as soon as we got the second goal, that's when you saw two, what I regard as 2-0 football or 2-0, and, and which was hit on the break give them all the ball and and say to them, can you get past us? Because that's how good we are defensively. But um, we did fantastically, Neil could have scored before it, but the goal itself, um, brilliant. The two ex-Chelsea players that people laughed at for us signing them um, were absolutely terrific again in this game. And it was funny to see Jorginho, you know, you know beating the offside trap and, um, and doing that. But it's just a brilliant run from Kai Havertz and really topped off a man of the match performance, didn't it? Yeah, uh, just before I talk about that, I'm just quickly going back to the panel, I forgot to mention their manager came out and said nothing wrong with it. And that's so refreshing to see an opposition opposition manager. I think that gets on quite well with Arteta, by the way. They've got a good good friendship there, which is nice. But I don't think that got in the way. He just came out and said it. He said, there's nothing wrong with it. Let's move on. He said, let's move on. Brilliant. Brilliant. How refreshing is that? It's good to see that. Um, and also, impartiality... I think I even tweeted about Alan Smith. I said, um, he takes it to the nth degree. It's ridiculous. Yes, you can be impartial, be professional as a pundit, but don't sit there slagging Arsenal off. You're taking it too far. Don't be anti-Arsenal, guys. Come on. You're, th- th- all these players, to me, are legends. They're all part of what, the team that I watched, and you know they're legends to me, and I'm, I don't really want to ever say anything negative about them, but calm your bloody punditry down, lads. Seriously. Anyway, no more on that. Let's talk about good stuff. Um, just before I, I hate interrupting, but just before new fans don't know Lee Dixon and Alan Smith. I know him, yeah. you know him, you know players before that. I don't know. Yeah. Like Alan Smith was the early portion of my supporting career, but I know them and I love them as players, right? Winning Cup Winners Cup with Alan Smith, mm. Lee Dixon winning titles. But new fans, there's a reason new fans love Ian Wright because Ian Wright acts like an Arsenal player should act. That's exactly how he should act. Frank McClintock. I didn't. I never watched Frank McClintock play. Mm. I love Frank McClintock. Why do I love Frank McClintock? Because every time he spoke about Arsenal, you could tell how much he loved the club. Yeah. That's all we're asking. We're not even asking for you not to be. We're not asking for you to be blinded. We're not blinded. We call out criticisms, right? But but don't not not support something because you, you're trying to be. They, they, there's a clear yeah, great clear point, Dixon and Smith, where they're trying to consciously think, oh, I can't be too pro Arsenal yeah. here, even if the decision is obvious. And that's the gripe that people have with Alan Smith. And that's the gripe that people will have with Lee Dixon. And new fans won't take to them. Like, and maybe they don't care about that. What do they care? They're not playing anymore. But 
when you pop back to the Arsenal Stadium and you, you walk out on one of those days that, you know, Arsenal legends are walking out, your cheer won't be very loud. And there's a reason it won't be very loud because new fans aren't going to care much about you. And they're going to go, oh, I'm, I know him commentating, you're irritating to me. But if Ian Wright walks out, no one's, there's tons of fans that haven't seen Ian Wright play, but they're going to love him because they watch him every, every week and they can tell that he cares as much as we do. And it's not hard to be like that. But yeah, sorry, carry on. No, 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 no. I think, well, look, Theo does it brilliantly. He's a, he's a great pundit from his little experience with it. And he's, I think he's fabulous, by the way. But he does also have those little kind of one-off sentences or he just comes up with something, which you know that he loves Arsenal dearly. He absolutely loves the club. And people endear, endear to, you know, they, I find him very endearing. I think he's great, by the way. Anyway, right, let's move on to, <laughs> let's move on to the goal. Um, I thought, I thought um, a lot was happening from the left on the left-hand side. And I like the fact that, I think we mentioned it two or three pods ago, that that why Odegaard and Saka triangle is just working so well again. But in fact, this time it was it was Jorginho because Saka was lying on the floor, wasn't he? It was great. <laughs> There's that little meme, isn't there? He does it? do it a little bit, doesn't he? <laughs> John, John went, look at me went, down again. John went mad about it. And I went, he was doing <laughs> it on purpose. He was opening up space. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jorginho quite, so thank you very much, I'll take Saka's place. And he was involved. And I thought firstly from him, like I said earlier, that he, he, he created a couple of chances for us early doors. Um, was involved in the chance creations and uh, that one he actually did become the the lad that assisted and I, I thought that was a good run by him but it's Kai Havertz's of awareness that's another thing which I've seen change in him since when he first came on board early you know early in the season that he was he, w- he wouldn't get into the optimal positions but if you looked at that look at that goal again he's like weaving through the penalty box going one way or the other to get into that optimal position. And I love that. And I love that. And I th- I think I wouldn't be surprised if those two have had a word outside of game time thinking we've got to do a, a goal where I assist and you score or vice versa. And it, and it, you could tell from their reaction, how happy they were because let's be honest, Jack, we haven't had the best experience with ex Chelsea players, but I think these two have broken that, broken that, nor, you know, that, that hoodoo. They have both for me. I find Jorginho simply so useful as a player with his experience. He's definitely going to be featuring a lot in the Champions League games. And I think he's, a, he's becoming a wonderful, wonderful signing for us. We mentioned it on the last pod that I hope he stays for another year as well. Um, you know, despite his, maybe his age or whatever, but I think he's such a useful guy. Kai Havertz, I think he just seems to be getting better and better. And it was a great, great goal. And it also eased all the tension because you knew, like you said, Aaliyah, that, you know, that was a 2-0 we needed. And then we could play as a 2-0, you know, in front team. And um, great, great goal. I thought, you know, great pass back from Junior or cut back from Jorginho. And Tavis was there, strong. And that's another thing. He, he was surrounded by players, but he's just so strong. And bang, the, and the celebration was great for them too. I loved it so much. Really pleased. Yeah. It was fantastic. It was a great movement from from Habits that we've seen quite a lot. You know, Brentford a few weeks back, he, you know, it was the same, you know, great movement in the box to go to win the header. And he's starting, like you said, and maybe being in that nine makes him just a little bit more comfortable with making those runs into the box consistently rather than maybe worrying about where he needs to positionally be from a defensive side of things, you know give him a little bit more freedom but obviously he, 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 he definitely seems like a confidence player and his confidence is high he may be maybe the player on the most form in the whole whole group at the moment to be honest but I thought Odegaard's ball through to Jorginho was fantastic too just the way he shifts his body and lays it on a plate for for Jorginho and I think it's great that Jorginho takes that extra touch too he just allows Havertz that little extra second to get into the box and he plays a wonderful Wonderful ball. And I thought Jorginho, while whilst I felt he was a little bit absent, maybe against City um, on the ball he, in this game, you know, felt felt like felt like old Jorginho again. Yeah, absolutely. And you saw in midweek Thomas Party play, and it's weird, isn't it? You watch Thomas Party, and you, and, and when you watch him now, you go, ah, oh, what's the reasons we used to love him more than Jorginho? Well, it was because he had a little bit quicker, incisive passing, but also because we felt he was a bit more of an athlete, right? 
And you don't, you're not sure about that anymore. Obviously, he hasn't played for very long, so it's a bit harsh to judge it. But you're certainly not sure about it anymore. And you, you, if he's if he's not, it's going to be very hard for him to get up to speed in the next six weeks to to be that guy. And also, he he loses the ball more. He loses the ball more than Jorginho. He gives up the ball more than Jorginho because he tries to play those passes. And sometimes his first touch is a little bit off, and he loses it there in possession. You know, you all remember even last season at his peak. You know. Uh, Rashford at home, um, even the Community Shield, uh, Cole Palmer's goal was caused by by Thomas Party trying to sort of win the ball too high up and getting, getting beaten. So you watch it and you kind of wonder and and watch it. I think Jorginho is definitely ahead of him in the pecking order. And you, you would have never have said that even at the start of the season. Both players are fit. Jorginho, is a, you wouldn't have said it. But now he's, he's definitely ahead of him in the pecking order for me. And, and it would... Now throw up the question of how are we going to use Thomas Partey? And I don't think anyone's really that sure. Because in midweek, Thomas Partey played for 60, 65 minutes and, and, and did okay. I thought he did fine. Um, and this, this game, he didn't even get on. And I, I, I and, and what was quite surprising for me was, especially when the game was kind of won at 2-0, was that Giordrino didn't come off. I mean, did he, he might have come off right at the end, but, but I'm not even sure. But he did basically played the whole game. So now you're throwing up a real conundrum as to, wow, is he going to be able to recover and, and be in time for, for for Tuesday and Bayern? And we'll get to that. But but I definitely think it's far too early to be starting a player like Thomas Partey. He doesn't look anywhere near ready for that level of game at this moment in time. I, I don't think so. I could be wrong and we might be surprised and he'll start Thomas Partey, but I'm struggling to see that. What, were your, what are your thoughts on how Thomas Partey maybe integrates and I think at this point helps Jorginho in terms of his legs and minutes and things like that? That's exactly what I was saying on WhatsApp yesterday afterwards, that I think he'll feature, I think he will feature against Bayern, but it's not going to be the main main man. He's not going to be the one that, I well, I'll be surprised if he starts. I can see him more coming on later on if the game is going well, just to free Jorginho up, because actually I think we're going to need Jorginho against Villa. It's Villa? Yeah, Villa, isn't it? On the weekend. So yeah. I think just, from a, just purely from a rotational point of view to rest players... That's why I think I can see Party featuring against Bayern. That's why I said, use the word feature. I don't think he's going to play the main role. But like you just said, we could be wrong. We could be surprised and he could start Party. I don't know. It's so funny, isn't it, Jack? You think about, like you said, the beginning of the season. I would never, ever have thought, how are we going to cope without Partey? You know, when the injury, you know, when we knew he was out and that was it. I was thinking, oh God, how are we going to? We all right. We all knew that Rice could play. <laughs> it was basically two signings in one, and he was great. He, I mean, he, he's brilliant at the six and the eight, whatever one we need him for. But you can't expect one player to do that throughout the whole season, especially if we're still in the in the Champions League. We thought, how's and Jorginho has been the answer. He's been brilliant. He's been absolutely great at the base to give the other two midfielders that creativity and the chance for Rice to dart up, up towards the front. It's been it's worked out actually in a weird way, although it might have been a bit fearful for us at the time. It's actually worked out really well because it's 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 given us, you know, given Rice certainly a new dimension to his game. Um, and it's almost like who's missed Partey this season? Who would have said that? Who would have, I know what you mean? Even at his prime, he gives away balls and stuff. But actually, when he is playing well, there's a few better than him. Jack, he can he can literally single handedly boss a whole midfield. He feels like a gigantic player. So let's not forget what he the good things that he has done. But we haven't missed him. And that's a massive testament to the, the, the players we've got around him or, you know, that can come in for him. But also, I, I just wanted to mention as well, the cuteness and the brilliance of our acquisitions from Edu and his team, and probably Arteta's got something to say, to say saying that as well, has been superb. Look at the players we brought in. The people that people weren't even expecting to have done well are absolutely doing well. Kai Havertz, and we got the song for him, but 65 million now seems short change, really, doesn't it? It's, it's like, yeah, it's not incredible. a great deal now, whereas before people were talking about it. No one was talking about Rice's price tag because he was doing so well. But everyone was talking about his money, but actually now it's disappeared. It's a thing of the past, apart from the song, which is more of an ironic thing now. It's more of a, more of a, you know, a bist sort of but it's more like a P take, isn't it? More than anything else. And um, you know, even even players like Jorginho that came in, 
and Trossard, of course. I mean, the, the, Kiwi or all of them. You th- who's actually been a bad signing lately? They're all they're all put, putting you know and making worthwhile contributions to the team. It's great to see for me. Yeah, yeah I mean that's why going into transfer windows and things like that, the, the biggest thing would be to just be relaxed because we can be, you know, like we, once you've got the trust in the, in the people that are making the decisions, you, you should be able to be relaxed about it. So it, now, I mean, me and James will talk nonstop daily about players we're linked to, but we always sort of have the running background noise of it doesn't matter if we're right or wrong here, because if they pick someone else, great because that means that's the player they wanted, you know? And sometimes you get, might get surprised for him. I have to say my initial thought, certainly on Jorginho as a signing, was, was oh, hold on a minute. You know, that doesn't feel quite in line with the club's ethos, aging player, da, 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 all this kind of stuff. But but no, he's been fantastic, hasn't he? No matter, how, you know, when he's played or how little or how much he's played, he looked like he's a great member of the squad. And now he's becoming a really, really key member of the first team. You know, he really is. And playing our biggest games. And I think, you know, he, he's really, really valuable in doing that. I mean, we, we're going to want him to play a lot of our biggest games. But yeah, the way I would view Party and Jorginho would be all the big games in terms of, you know, uh, ones that we're... You know, up against, you know, United away, Spurs away, the Bayern games, future Champions League games, hopefully beyond that, I would be playing Jorginho in most of those. But the others, you know, where you may be hoping that you dominate more um, in terms of territory and the ball, I, 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 that's where I think Thomas Party would come in. Or can Thomas Party come in at 60 minutes to to transition or if we need a goal, that would be more of an attacking sort of substitution for Jorginho, which is why I was a little surprised. I think we scored in the 62nd minute, the second goal. I was a little surprised Jorginho didn't come off around that point and he, and he didn't and he, and he, and he stayed. And that's what makes me wonder about midweek and what his plan is. But I think that's what he wants. He wants to share wondering about midweek and what his plan is as well. And I, if we're questioning in three or four positions, then the other manager is going to be because he, you know, Tuchel doesn't know as much about Arsenal as we do, um, and th- th- that's where we're at with it. So I think that's Mikel Arteta's intention, anyway. You know, best um, best thing is um, to be a little bit disguised and 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 questioning what we might be doing. But yeah, fantastic second goal, and then we and then we start the low block deal. At that point, two 0 Well, I think we had one chance. Maybe uh, Trossard had a, had a one on the break that he hit um, that almost went in, but got sneaks around the post and he was very positive when he came on when he trossed hard and he got his goal and it's a great assist by I don't know who wins the ball back I think it might be Odegaard that wins the ball back because they they, they they loosen it there but we we basically just sat for for 15 minutes we gave him probably 85% possession in that time and I was kind of watching it quite nervous but at the same time deep down going they're not getting through this there's no way they're getting to they're not going to create something from it they had 0.57 XG, you know, they had two shots on target. I don't remember the second one. They had one that was in CISO from 30 yards out, which was tipped over, which was a good wide by a, a good save by David Raya. I, I do not remember the other chance. So I presume it was straight into David Raya's hands or something like that. Um, I, do, I can't remember it for the life of me, to be honest. But 0.5, so just to keep it in perspective, 0.57 XG, um, creation for Brighton, the fifth most creative team in the league, according to the data, roughly, um, is more is less, sorry, than what Sheffield United created at Anfield um, a few days ago. You know, I think we, we are just an incredibly strong team off the ball, defensively. I mean, we really are. And since the turn of the year, we've, we've improved dramatically in that area. We were good anyway. <laughs> But we were making errors at the back, I think. And we, you remember we would sit on here and be like, I don't know how we keep conceding because we're not giving up chances. But when we do give them up, they're really big chances and they we get punished for them. And, and we're not giving those up as much anymore. But you have to say when you watch Party and you watch Zinchenko, you start to see why they're not maybe starters because those are the type of players that actually give up the chances and he's kind of eradicated that since January one through injury one through party wasn't available before that anyway and you just wonder I know Zinchenko started our last two games but I I have to say I feel in the last two games watching Zinchenko start them both he's moved further away from being a first 11 player than he was before those two games. But I don't have a clue if that's what Mikel Arteta sees. What what, what are your thoughts on him? Um, 
what are my thoughts on him? I, 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 it's hard not to like the player because I, I find him. Um, it's kind of like uh, what Ramsdale used to be for me. He's, he's, he's got that enthusiasm. He's very passionate. You can see that he wants the team to do well. There's no doubt about that at all. You know, I, I, I can't question any of that. He's always the one flinging his arms in the air, trying to get the crowds, you know, going. It's, it's, I know Odegaard does it a lot, but he does it. Gabriel's another one that does it. I mean, all of that I love about him. And yes, when things are going well, we've always said it, he's, he's useful to have. He's very creative, but I've just... I just can't get my head around the fact that he's not... Well, I can't get my head around of it because if the answer is there. He's not a defender, Jack. He's not. He's better at creation and he's better at, in that position where he's moving forward and doing the inverted role or whatever it is. Defensively, I just it makes me nervous. And it's, look, if Kiwi, well, Kiwi wasn't there, if Tommy Asu couldn't play on the left then we'd have no choice and we'd have to just end up what well, it is, what it is. And we've got, you know, we haven't got much choice here, have we? But we've got so much inter- interchangeability there at the back. If there's such a word. We've got, we've, we've got the flexibility. We've got, hopefully Timber will be ready for the next season. Uh, I'm not talking about this season, but, and I'm just thinking, I, I know I'm stepping ahead. I can't see where he's going to fit in next for next season. I just, I can't see it. Kiwi or Tomiyasu, Timber, we might even look at getting well, some of the younger players might even start breaking through. Don't know. Um, where's he going to fit in? Just don't need him in midfield. We don't even need him to play that inverted role anymore. And defensively, he's, he's average at best. So from from that point of view, I can't I can't see where he's going to fit in. And he just makes me nervous. I, I, I don't feel comfortable when a, a team's on the attack and he's there. I can remember one interception he did make in the box which was good yesterday, but that's about it. And that's not great because sometimes you don't talk about a player because you don't need to. I don't talk, talk, talk too much about Odegaard because we know what we get from him. He's just so great. I'm actually now thinking that I'm talking more about Gabriel at the back rather than Saliba. That's not to say Saliba isn't doing a grand majestic job because he blooming well is. There was one one incident where he was surrounded by two or three Brighton players and even the commentator goes, my God, he's just so calm. It's ridiculous. He make he, it looks like he's only playing in second gear, but he's inside our box, so, wasn't it? I think. Yeah, just Incredible. so brilliant. This guy is. You, don't, you, you kind of like it's a weird thing. You don't talk about him not because you think he's he's having a rubbish day. It's because he's so damn good. It's just expected. It's almost become the norm for us to see that players like Odegaard and Saliba doing what they do. But you know, so sometimes when you don't talk about play, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's the young unsung hero, isn't it? We used to do that a lot with Ben White, but Ben White has improved amazingly. But I think Zinchenko, I just don't, I don't see a future for him. And I don't know how much he's going to feature going forward. So it is really interesting to see that he's come in and played. Oh, he's had quite a lot of minutes in the last two games, but maybe he's not so certain about Tommy Atsu's um, fitness. Is he trying to keep Kiwi away, you know, after the Man City game and maybe shield him a little bit? I'm not so sure what the reasoning is behind that. If he is thinking of using him a lot for the next few games, I'm not quite sure why, Jack. Maybe you know the answer, but I'm scratching my head over that. So I don't know. I I, I don't think he's the answer for me. No, I, I tend to agree with you, and I am a, I am a huge Zinchenko fan. But I think what's thrown it us off since January is if you said our most creative, fruitful period of the season in terms of goals and goal creation was going to be a time where Zinchenko was out injured, you'd have questioned it, or I would have, earlier in the season. But that's the truth of it. We've been the most creative when he's not been in the team. And I think Arteta's noticed that. I hope he has. I'm sure he has. And and gone, OK. And I think a lot of the fans have gone, the ones that would give him a little bit of a pass on the defensive stuff, Hold on a minute. I gave him a pass on the defensive stuff because I felt he was so critical to our attacking output. But he's not. Because in the last eight, ten games in the league, he's not been. And we've not needed him. And we've been more defensively secure because of it. So our weaknesses have been strengthened. And where we thought he was really, really valuable, we've also improved there. So you look at that and you question it a little bit. And, and and you wonder what that might what that might be. The one player that throws me on the left back, because we're going to talk about that for the for the Bayern game, and I think 
we could come up with completely different answers. But is Kivior, we don't really know what Mikel Arteta thinks of Kivior. The only time he's started a run of games has been when Tommy Asu and Zinchenko have been out. And now they're back and maybe he, he doesn't start as many games. I think that's a little bit harsh on Kivior, to be honest. I think he's been pretty, kind of been good and solid. Came off around the 60th minute against City. So he started the City game. So that's a lot of faith there because I, I don't think Tommy Asso and Zinchenko were, you know, unfit to not be able to start. I bet you he would have started them, you know, in previous seasons at that point. Um, so... But yeah, it's kind of interesting that he's not featured for a minute in the last two games. That's quite, quite interesting, you know. Um, I did feel, though, around the Man City game that he probably would need some rest because he played like, you know, 200 minutes in, in a national break and stuff like that. So that's the one. But, but really looking at our defence currently, Neil, maybe we've got two unbelievable centre-backs and a ton of full-backs. Is that what we've got? It's We don't really know, do we? But maybe that's what we've got. We've got Two incredible centre backs and a ton of, you know, really valuable full backs. It maybe he sees Tommy Esso and Kibio and Ben White and Zinchenko and Timber as full back options. And that's why I wonder in the summer whether we, we look to get that third centre back in, but I could be completely wrong. But yeah, I agree with you on Zinchenko. I, I, I think it's very interesting the amount of minutes he's played in the last two games. It throws me off a little bit. Um, ultimately, you know, I wouldn't say we got away with it as such. He did fine going forward in this game. But again, I think two or three corners that we conceded were because of his defensive lapses. Um, whether it was because he um, let the ball go over his head and we saw that where they would switch the play early on in the first half and he was getting caught quite a lot on that and you know Zinchenko gets caught on that because he pushes forward too much. Or whether he just take the extra touch and play that extra pass that he didn't need to play and and suddenly we, we'd get caught on it a little bit and it, it kind of threw us a little bit. So I'm at a real sort of question about, about what we do on Tuesday. But before we get to that, Neil, the third goal, terrific. It remo- I have to say, it reminded me of a game, I think in 2004 during the unbeaten season. Someone's going to tell me I'm wrong here. Where we beat Birmingham, I think it was 3-0 at Birmingham. And Burkamp scored on a breakaway with a chip. And I, I don't know if you remember it, but he, was, he just ran the whole centre of the pitch and he got to the goalkeeper and he just dinked it over the goalkeeper. And when I saw the goal, okay, Trossard, I was like, that really reminds me of of that goal and, and that game. But it was a brilliant ball from Havertz again. And Trossard, he actually looked really fast away on the breakaway and super composed. And it was lovely to see because he was getting booed by the crowd, which I think is a little bit harsh on Trossard, to be honest. He did pretty good for Brian, didn't he? Um, but it was lovely to see him silence them, who was ever, who was left of them. Because stadiums are empty everywhere we go, but brilliant, Neil. I just love that. Uh, that um, it, it was him that posted that thing. Are oh, you not entertained? Yeah, it was him. Yeah. How good is that? I, yeah. I, I loved it. I don't tend to look at players much what they do, but that that was fantastic. I thought that sums it up. I thought he was great. He actually started to move Jack. It wasn't Odegaard. He won the ball back. Cavett grabbed it off him and passed it to him. So it was just those two that created that third goal, which I love. Um, and have its numbers, man. Goals and assists. Great, isn't it? Um, what a player. What a player. Brilliant. Uh, anyway, but Trossard, I think I've seen, I, I was at one of the games where he showed a flash of pace down when, that's when he was on the on the left. And I thought, oh, all the people in the crowd were like, we've not seen. As if, did you freeze there? Oh, Just froze. four or five seconds. Of yeah, yeah. I saw it. Saw it happen when you were talking earlier as well. I thought, oh, not here we go again. We got the we got the gremlin in. Yeah, the trying to ruin it gremlin is trying to ruin it. It's, it's probably it's probably someone from Sky <laughs> trying to kill our narrative. Yeah, Gary so, we're, 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 do we, we talk positive? You see, not like that's you what lot. it is. That's what it is. So anyway, I, <laughs> I, I hope it doesn't happen again because I'm excited about talking about draw cards. I, I saw that flash of pace then and all the crowd were like bamboozled by me. I thought, who knew that he could do that? And we saw it again, you know, yesterday for you, today still probably. Um, he was, brilliant. He's not brilliant. slow, is he? No, not slow at all. The defender was never catching. Even the commentator said, he ain't catching him. He ain't catching him. And it was yeah. just about his finish. And I like the fact that he almost did a slight dummy, very quick if you noticed it, if you look back, which I think then started sending the keeper to the floor. Very clever, but to, to do it so quickly within the split second, and then just lift the ball over him. That's not an easy skill, Jack. 
especially when you're under pressure, especially when you're playing against your former club at their ground. That's all. But he was so calm and confident. And, and that celebration was just fantastic. I loved it. He just summed it up, shut the club, silenced the crowd. You know, uh, who was it you or James who put on the WhatsApp that he scored against his old club? Rice Cole was scored against, and it only leaves Havertz to score against Chelsea now. Um, fingers crossed. That would be just the icing on the cake, wouldn't it? But it, it was great to see. And then that was it. That just, for me, that was nice because it's just another goal for our goal difference as well, which could end up being very, very important now. You know, who, who would have thought that we would be so far ahead of City and Liverpool who have been the prolific goal scorers over the last few years? And look at us. We're flying, man. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to see where our goal different. I mean, obviously we were behind in December before the uh, the sort of Dubai break in terms of, but we were behind in terms of points, but we were way behind in terms of goal difference too, Neil. I mean, way behind you know we were we were very very behind both teams and then we had that huge flush and everyone said oh yes only because they're playing Burnley and Sheffield United well now all the other teams play Burnley and Sheffield United so so it's you know and, and you saw in midweek I mean Liverpool needed two late goals to to beat them so it's not always as simple as it might seem sure they got the win okay but but you know to, to rack up the goals and those teams have, have the capability of, of turning goal differences in a game or two so I certainly don't think it's it's un, un um, retrievable from their perspective, but you know it, it, we, we're scoring freely too. So and and the, and the facts are we aren't conceding very much at all. We concede far less than they do. We saw City this they won, but they still conceded too. You know and 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 we're not conceding as much. So so therefore, even if you end up scoring less, your goal difference could well be you know far far more powerful because. You know, you're not conceding. You're just you're not if you're not conceding, and and that's really really helpful. Yeah, Trossard, I think it's his eighth Premier League goal of the season. One assist last year it was flipped. He had ten assists and only one goal. This year he's all about the goals. But yeah, he looked very sort of Lundberg esque. You know, when you're running with the ball and he's still going away from from defenders. And he, I think he is our best finisher. You know, I thought about it I, I, that that finish, and I felt quite confident with him running through. And I think he is our best best finisher, to be honest. And that's. You know, if you if you had Jesus going through there, he would have made it. He would have run through, but he wouldn't have finished it like that. There's that you just wouldn't, would he? And you wouldn't be confident about him doing it. And that's not to say he's not a quality player. And he hasn't got the pace and all that kind of stuff. But there's just that little bit of calmness that you need when you go through on goal. And and he's definitely got it, Trossard. And and crazily, he puts himself in the hat for for the Bayern mix with with that goal. And maybe he was in the hat anyway. I'm sure he was. But for a start there, you know, he could because he's been probably one of our best um, Champions League players so far this season too, um, alongside Gabriel Jesus. So it's real dilemma now, Neil. I mean, 3-0, fantastic win. Kai Havertz, definitely man of the match, but there was others that were fantastic there. I thought Odegaard was great again. He was he was man of the match for me in, in midweek. <clears throat> but you could argue, Neil, our whole left side against Bayern is up for debate. Um, and you, you know, you, you, and there's probably three players in each position that you could select. Bayern just came off of a 3 2 loss. So I do want to say this on Bayern. I think teams that have nothing to play for domestically are tremendously dangerous in the Champions League, especially when they're a big team with a lot of prowess and a lot of um, uh, history. In, in the competitions, you know, you've seen in the past where Chelsea won the Champions League a few years back, they weren't challenging for the league title that season. Liverpool in 2005, I mean, might be the worst team that's ever won the Champions League. Um, they weren't anywhere near titles at that point. They were barely scraping into Champions League's um, qualifications. Um, obviously, Bayern aren't quite that, but they have absolutely nothing to play for domestically. The league's over for them. Leverkusen are going to win it for the first time in their history. Um Thanks to Granite Xhaka, and that, that you know that's it. Uh, but I think it's tremendously dangerous. I know they look really uh, poor. I think they were two 0 up, and they lost three two in Germany, and you know a lot of stuff. I think he also rested a few, but but might show up in the team. It was a pretty strong lineup they put out. But they they're going to bring their A game. This is their biggest game left of this season, right? And they've certainly able to rotate and rest more than we can right now. Um, so Neil, what are your thoughts? But what just before that, what do you what would you do on the left side? Because I, I I feel like unless you feel otherwise, the rest of the team almost picks itself, but the left side is is like genuinely up for debate. I mean, you could have a conversation about it for a while, probably. What would I do? My goodness me! 
Um, I would like to see Martin and Martin any stroke Trossard up front on the left, and I would like to see Kiwi all behind them. Simply because I, I I'm just nervous about Sinjenko. I know it, I know it's crazy for me to talk like this because I was loving Sinjenko at the beginning when he first came on board. I was absolutely in love with the guy, and uh, you're right, we we he was pretty much one of our only creative outlets, but we don't need him for that. We certainly don't are not going to miss his defensive errors. Kiwi, or for me, has looked pretty solid. I don't know why he hasn't featured so much after Man City, but you could be right because he did. He was quite active in international duty and maybe he's just managing him better. I don't know. I don't know. But that's what I would like. Whether we get that or not, I don't know. But I think there's an argument to start either with Trossard or Martinelli. But, you know, then that's a big call to leave Jesus out because it's going to be Sack on the right and he's surely sticking with Habits in the nine. So massive call to leave Jesus out. But I think that's the beauty of where we are at because we, we dream dream of these moments, Jack, to be playing against tough sides, to be you know progressing high in the big competition, which i.e. the Champions League, you know, uh, the knockout competition, to be challenging for the Prem title. It's going to mean that there's going to be some decisions where some players who you think are certain starters might not necessarily start the game. So that's what I'd like. I don't know what he's going to do. I think it's quite interesting to see what he ends up doing. Um, but I think Trossard's put a case in. I think Martinelli, whether he scores loads of goals, goals or not, his injection of pace is going to frighten defenders for, for sure. You've got him as a disruptor. You've got Havertz as a disruptor. And we all know what Saka can do. And I think Saka, that penalty probably would have helped him as well because he was really upset with the miss miss. Because as I said, nine times out of ten he converts that 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 chance, uh, the one that he put wide. And I think he was he said it himself, he said, you know, I was quite gutted with that. So now that penalty putting that away so confidently would have helped him. You know, I think he's gonna be a threat as well. Um I <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what he's going to do with it, but the, it's a nice to have options. And you know, you're saying about Bayern Munich um, having the you know having this only to focus on. I completely get it. I understand that. But we've just got to focus on what we're doing. The fact that we are in the quarterfinals after 14 years is going to be enough to motivate all of the players. They're loving the fact that they're involved in two of the biggest competitions in the world. I would say, club wise. Um, as I think the Prem is the best league in the world, to be honest, and the Champions League is the is the you know the best club competition footballing wise, isn't it? So the fact that they're involved in both, there's a chance to progress in both and to do well. There's not much. It doesn't matter that we're playing games three, four games a week. Uh, uh, sorry, a game every three or four days. I think they they're, they're going to be so up for it, Jack. I, I don't see a problem, and the fact that Bayern might only have this. Con- I, I know it's dangerous. They're going to put putting all their eggs in one basket. But sometimes that's a bad thing as well because they're only focusing on one thing and that can backfire. I think having the home advantage sometimes isn't the best as a first leg, but hopefully it will work out well for us. We'll almost put the game to bed, hopefully. It's going to be so hard. But if we can do that and then we can do a bit of rotation near the end of the game to rest the players for Villa, that's the ideal scenario, isn't it? But it's going to be a tough one for sure, yeah. I agree. Oh, sorry, mute. sorry, I was on mute. Um, you're going to give your Martinelli. I have to say, I mean, I understand your your feeling, but that it's weird, isn't it? Martinelli really hasn't played a lot um, since he cut his foot um, a few weeks, but you know, a month ago or so ago, over a month ago now, and you're not really sure if he's if he's fully fit or he's truly just really easing him back. It would be very because he could have started one of the last two. I would have thought if he was fit you know they would you would, you would think he would have started and and give you all i could see because he's, he's only missed a couple of games he played against city a week ago so um i could see that I, i've been quite interested by how he's been using tommy Asso over the last week or so building his minutes a little bit um the likelihood is uh, you know, depending on who they play out there, but they, they, he could come up against someone like Leroy Sane. That's, that's who they tend to play on the right wing. I know they got Coleman, but I'm not sure if he's fully back from injury. They also sometimes play Muller out there. Nabry's usually the guy that plays on the left wing. I mean, how good he is. Um, but Sane is a really tricky wing. I, I think it's fantastic. I wanted Sane when he left um, City. But um, 
Tricky, really, really tricky. And that's why I find it really difficult to believe that he would start Zinchenko. But at the same time, Neil, in order to win this tie, we probably have to win the first game. You know, we, we, you know, we, we probably have to win the first game. So does he look at that and think, I need Zinchenko in there? You know, I, I, I tend not to think that. I, t- I tend to struggle to believe that. And I tend to believe that the amount of minutes he's got in the last two games is indicative that he won't get as many in this game. So I, then it leaves you give your Tomiyasu. I'll go Tomiyasu just because I feel like Sane is a real danger player and and I, I think he might be a, a, a match-up for them. And um, the left-wing one's really hard. I have no idea. I, I really don't. I, I get the feeling that we would have seen Martinelli a little bit more if he would have started. I mean, was he played like 10 minutes in the last three games? Did he, how much did he play against Luton, Neil? Did it? Did he? Did 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 he? I'm, I'm gonna look it up now because we. Yeah, have a look. I can't remember. He, he, he didn't start, right? He no. didn't start against Lewin. No. So let me have a quick look. Sorry, I have a quick look. I, I should have got what that. Um, I can't remember. I'll have a look. But so he's not played a lot of minutes anyway. Like not as many as I think a lot of us would have no, thought at this point. No, I'm saying and or Trossard. I'll say yes. Two. Yeah, and I, I I think he can very well go Jesus, but I um. I think it will be Trossard or Jesus. I'm I'm really struggling to okay. think he's going to do Martinelli. Um, so I'll go I'll go Trossard for that. Tommy Asu and Trossard. But again, Jesus has been so good in the Champions League. It's hard to see. I see he came on. I can't see the minute, but I have to look at the timeline. Okay. I don't get it. But yeah, not a lot. But um, Neil, they they they're dangerous. They're a dangerous side. No, they're not having a great season domestically. But to, mm. to Shell is the modern day Marafa Benitez. He is a cup coach. He won the Champions League with Chelsea. He got to the final with Paris Saint Germain and lost to Bayern in that final. Oddly enough, right? He's very very good in the in the European Cup competitions. He is. He knows how to set his team up. He's sort of made for that competition, and it will be another level up to to what Porto were. For sure, I think. And we're going to have to play a lot better than we did against Porto to win this tie. I I, I don't have a doubt about that. But, um, I mean, there's the slight other question mark, Neil, would be, you know, if you did something different in midfield, could you see us possibly dropping Rice deeper and playing Havertz at the eight? I can't see that happening. Could you possibly see us playing Party in the six and Rice at the eight? I, I, I also can't see that happening, but more likely. But but still, I don't think he's got the minutes. Yeah, he came on for 15 minutes against Luton. It, it, oh, right. I'm, I'm just looking at that and going, if he's fully fit, Reese Nelson was dreadful, I thought, against Luton. Oh, he was, he was awful, dreadful. Yeah. Wasn't he dreadful? Wasn't he dreadful? Mm. Just so safe with the ball. Smith Rowe was great. Luton, Nils, Reese Nelson, no. Yeah, yeah, Smith Rose pushed himself maybe above the Nelsons, Eddies, and Vieira yeah. at that point. I think yeah. I don't yeah. know how much further than that, but he definitely pushed himself above those three. I think with that performance, um, and if we need something, he might be one of the first to come off the bench after a you know. Surely a, he'll a, be on the bench James for that. Or, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so we think it stays the same. But the left side is up for grabs because we both yes. picked two different players. So we're obviously the left side. It's not like we're the only on it. But sorry to interrupt. The only reason why I kind of went for Kimi, I heard you were talking about Tommy Asu uh, yesterday on the, on, on the on the WhatsApp. And I, there's nothing wrong with that argument. And I, I I see what you're saying. The only reason why I've kind of just favoured Kimi is because he's been more involved recently yeah. with that defensive balance. That's all yeah. I'm saying. So he's had more minutes than Tommy Asu. He's been successful as well. Like they all have this, this yeah. whole calendar year. That's the only reason, and I, I, I don't know why he's rested him for literally two games after after City. So that's the only question mark I have. It's really weird the, art, the game Arteta is playing, and this is like you're saying he's trying to confuse their manager. Oh, he's, I, he's I, definitely I think, I think doing it's that. Great. I mean, I mean, why not? If you've got players which are not going to be dropping a great let deal in terms of level that can come in. Why not, you know, change it around a bit just to confuse? Because Bayern, if they're if they're really focused on this, they're going to be deeply investigating and micro looking at our our games and seeing what we're doing very very closely. Yeah. And I wonder if Arteta had one eye on that, thinking, "All right, okay, I'm going to mess you around a bit. I'm going to play mind games with you." Could be because it doesn't affect the football because the levels are not dropping, are they? Um, with with the, with the switches, um, it's interesting. But that's the only reason why I thought maybe Kiwi or, but you're right. It could be Tommy Asu. Could be Tommy Asu and Trossard. It could it could stick with Jesus, for all we know. But you were worried about Jesus's um issue with his knee, weren't you? And um and I wonder whether they're still managing that a little bit. I don't I know. I think we are. Be. 
I think yeah. we definitely are. I mean, you know, when, when he goes from playing, starting a game, he, he comes off quite early now. Um, and also, you know, which which you wouldn't have to do always. You could move him inside and give Havertz a break, especially when the games are won. Um, but he comes and then other games, he, he just doesn't feature whatsoever. I think we're managing him massively. Maybe maybe we're looking at him and saying he's a one game a week player. Uh, we could mm. be doing that. And, and next week, maybe he just plays him one. I, I, don't, I don't know, but I definitely think there's some management there um, on him. Um, and we'll find out a little bit more about that in the summer or whatever but it's a really interesting one Neil you could go either way with it on the left side it's really and that's what he wants he wants to throw that up in the air and I'm sure a lot of what he's done in the in recent weeks has done that I just with the left back I just think he, he Sane was a player that he worked with and he knows how good Sane is right, and right. if Sane it, it might Sane might not be fit he, I, I know he didn't feature in this game but but I, I don't think it's anything major so I think there's a good chance he'll probably be there and I think maybe he's just looking at that and thinking you know I need to shut down a shut down player maybe a little bit more but I wouldn't be surprised I, I would be surprised if Zinchenko started I have to say that I would not be surprised if it was Kivio or Tommy Asu I, I, I think I would be quite surprised after the last two games to see Zinchenko start in there I, I, I mean you know this is going to be fine margins isn't it so Neil um, before we go uh, Liverpool play Man U tomorrow I don't have any hopes for it I've watched Man U a lot this season but um, you 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 do, and 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 that's that, that's fair, and and I, I won't be watching it at all. But but um, it's at Old Trafford, but they've got they've got about twenty four centre backs out or something stupid like that. And I watched them in midweek, and they were what was it? They were winning in the ninety ninth minute and lost by the hundredth minute. I mean, they are yeah. they are dreadfully hopeless, aren't they? I mean, they really are. So I don't think I hold out. Oh, uh, it's comedy much, goal. Uh, that was. Yeah, I don't hope. I was at the. I was at. Uh, I was in Palm Springs with my with my kids, and I was at the zoo, and I and Cindy was like, "Why do you keep checking your phone?" I went, "I, I, I don't know what's happened." I went, "Someone just scored twice." I was like, what? "She went, I thought Arsenal." She was like, "I thought Arsenal played yesterday," and I went, "We did, but there's other <laughs> games going on, you know." I was like, I can't "That's hilarious, Jack." That's hilarious. And I was like, "Poor Cindy, poor Cindy, what's he doing now?" They play. Yeah, because like she once the Arsenal game in, she, she yeah. realizes she can get that's a hilarious. human being back. That's the ninety minutes that I'm allowed to be a child for. So. <laughs> I'm allowed to move beyond that phase. Oh, don't, don't. So if I'm, if I'm checking something, then she's like, she's got the look on me. She's like, what are you doing? Um, like that kind of stuff. But yeah, I, I don't hold out much. But you hold out a little bit more optimism, maybe? Well, yeah, I thought, you never know. Um, it's, it's, still, it's, still, it's like when we used to play, you know, when we were so far ahead of Tottenham in the Wenger days, you still could never discount them. I know we, we had such a great record against them. But it's still that derby, isn't it? And for I know Man United, it really their derby is Man City, City, but it's always been Liverpool, isn't it? And Liverpool, Man United have always had that that rivalry. You just can't you can't say for hundred for certainty that Liverpool are going to win this game. That's that, that's how I see it. There's a chance, but if you if, if if you look at the form book, yeah, you'd think Liverpool have got this in the bag. But I but I hope United can do something. But at the same time we've also got to go to United as well. So I'm not going to get too carried away. Even if United beat them and get three points, I'm going to like be singing and celebrating too much because we've got to go there as well as we've got to go to Tottenham. So, you know, it's still still difficult, difficult games for us. But that's that's why I'm saying that. I think we've got to focus on us. It'll be a bonus if something we get something, you know, something comes good comes out of today. It, may, it might be a draw, maybe a Man United win. But at the same time, we've just got to focus on us. And at the moment, all the focus is now on Champions League. So I'm not going to worry too much about it, Jack. It'll be it'll be a nice if it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. We've just got to make sure that we are fully switched on to the next game, and then obviously Villa after that. And just we we can only do what we can do. The destiny is not in our hands, unfortunately. But in a way, like you know, when I said it in the last one, I'm not that bothered about being on the top because I think. I think we handle pressure a little bit better when we're slightly not, the focus isn't on us. The focus was so on us last season because number one, it was so unexpected. We were top of the table right from the start, weren't we? Right till April. It's unreal. Very much unreal. like Liverpool have been this season. Yes, I mean, correct. no one's talked correct. about that. No one's no. talked about that. I mean, it was being talked about for yeah. eight, uh, they were counting days for us last season. Mm -hmm. 
but no one's talked about the fact that Liverpool have been basically on top for the majority of this season and um, they were five points clear of us they were eight points clear of the City I think at one stage um, no one's talked about that either but um, um, well they're still on, t- on, on the top you know um, in that in that sense but but yeah it was non-stop being talked about when we were there wasn't it it was non-stop but yeah yeah no I, I agree with you. it's it's, 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 um, it's a tough one but We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Um, what's your predictions for Bayern, mate? Bayern at home, Tuesday night. Uh, what's your predictions? I have no idea because this is so new. Not been in the quarterfinal for 14 years, Jack. It's tough, isn't it? Um, yeah. I think, like you said, I think we, if we're going to win the win over two leagues, we have to win at home. We have to. So I'll go... Oh, I just don't know too much about them, to be honest. Um, oh, gosh. So this is a guess. And I'll go with I'll go with two nil. Unlike our other ones, which are all definitively <laughs> right. <laughs> in the sense that I don't really know anything about them, Jack. I know nothing. I don't watch football outside of the Prem, so I, I have oh, no idea. Fine, yeah. um, I, I'm just going to go with two nil. I'll go with two nil wow. because we have That'd to be win. A huge result. I mean, oh, really it will be. I mean, even a one nil will be a huge result. To be yeah. fair, but I'll, I'll go two nil because I think we've we've just got something about us and. I hope we can keep a clean sheet. I, find, I can't see how teams are breaking us down at the minute. I just can't. In Europe, it feels different though, it. Neil, you know? In yeah. Europe, it, it, oh, no, it, no, even for it. us in a it. sense, but... I get it. Look, if it was a way, I would have said a different scoreline. I would have said that we would have conceded, but we're playing at home. I, we've got the wind in ourselves, Jack, and I think all the players are so up for it. They must be. They must be so excited. I, I think... 2-0, I, 2-0. Two nil, two nil. Shut up, Neil. 2-0. Two nil. And um and um I'll I'll say Saka actually. Two nil Saka, uh first scorer. And I just want to quickly mention before you give your prediction, what I think you did touch on it, but Reyes' save was unreal. That Enzico is a great player, by the way. I was Yeah, I like him. Wow, I like this player. Like he's him. pretty he's handy. He's come back from a big injury too. Yeah, and he's yeah. Just still to do that. I mean yeah. the way he set himself up for that chance, he, he, he that was but he was doing a lot more than that throughout the game. But I for when he was on, but I thought he was a tremendous player, by the way. Very useful. But that was a fantastic save. That should be just yeah. like save of the month. I thought, some of, I thought some of his distribution was was really good as well, I have mm. to say. You know, when we wanted to break break their press, he went short, he went sometimes fizzed it into the centre of the park. He, he he he's he's really looking more and more comfortable in every game brilliant he's fantastic yeah he's looking more, and he's just so calm isn't he just so mm. calm and I think that that generates through the team a little bit you know and uh, we've got to mention as well uh, Gabrielle's block and the celebration was was fantastic wasn't it says it all doesn't it yeah and that's huge really Neil because I mean we're 3-0 up there and, and you know most people, most sides, even the top sides, they kind of switch off a little bit. And but they, they, to not even allow the shot on goal, you know, it was going in. By the way, it was, um, oh yeah, is is huge, you know. And he's just he, he lo- you can tell he loves defending. He loves defending, and that's all the best defenders love defending, don't they? But but it's also didn't we do? Didn't he do that when we were? Which team were we beating comprehensively? Was it a Liverpool? Or it might be a Liverpool. Oh okay. Oh do you no, remember, you were right. Yeah, it was at West Ham away. Yeah. And, and they did the same thing because, and people are thinking, why is he getting so happy? I mean, we've won the game comprehensively. It's not the point. The yes. fact that they're keeping a clean sheet means the so standards. much to them. For them, it's exactly, it's the high standards. And doing that is as good as scoring a goal for a defender for me. Um, oh, it's majestic to see that, isn't it? Because it, 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 it gives the fans so much good feeling that it, because you're seeing from the players what it means to them because it means so much to us. And I think there's that connection. I think it's fantastic. Oh, Jack, this is a great time to be an Arsenal fan, isn't it? It's a great time to be an Arsenal fan all the time, but you know what I mean. It's great. Yeah, look, I mean, look, we're in it. Big time in it. Yeah. Seven games to go and we're, we're, we're big time in it. There's no question about that. We're not the favourites. We're not even the second favourites, but we're in it. And there's no one question that. And um, that, that's brilliant again. So, so let's see where it goes. But I'll go, um, I'll go 2-1. I'll go 2-1 yeah. Arsenal and... Uh, Odegaard I'll go Odegaard um, who by the way I mean some of these players playing the amount of, I mean we, we managed to give Declan Rice a rest in midweek but the likes of our two centre-backs and Odegaard and Havertz they really don't get much of it at all you know those guys are playing some serious minutes right now and we've even managed to get yeah Rice and Saka some decent rest and Martinelli in there but those four 
obviously yeah. goalkeepers there too but those four are, are like and you have to I guess you have to include Ben White at the moment which is the one I think we need to look at trying to give a few minutes somewhere where, where we can put Tommy Asu there or or something like that I, I don't know when that would be uh, maybe maybe it's Villa I don't know but but we we need to look at that um, good as well that Havertz didn't didn't get the the, the yellow card I think the Villa game is still there, although it's some debate about whether he's on eight yellow cards or nine. If he's on eight, then the Villa game doesn't really matter because it resets after the Villa game. If he's on nine, then he could still get that suspension if he if he if he gets oh. Villa. But but it doesn't matter where you look. When you look it up, he's on eight. But other people are claiming nine. I, I don't really know. But um, hopefully. You know, we'll handle it well. We seem to do pretty well against Brian. It didn't seem to affect his game at all, did it? So um, <laughs> we shouldn't worry about it too much. Neil, we're at Purely Arsenal FP on Twitter, Purely Arsenal on YouTube. Hopefully this will be out for your listening pleasure on Sunday before the buying game on Tuesday. We'll keep our fingers crossed for a positive result. First time back in the Champions League quarterfinals in 14 years. Um, as Mickey Arteta says, let's go for it, yeah? Let's go for it so um, up the Arsenal thank you for listening thank you for all your tweets and your comments and your comments on YouTube appreciate it and um, we'll be back after after the, the Bayern and Villa games keep your fingers crossed up the Arsenal